Okay. Let's do it. Uh, so now the, we want to recover. We want to recover the uh, Laplace transform of Laplace transform of cosine kt. S square plus k square. Right. So originally you used the, the direct transform formula to calculate that and, sh and show that it is this one, right? But now we want to confirm the inverse transform. So, so now we want to calculate the inverse transform of this function. Right, when you use the formula, right, you have multiple two pi i, right, and integrating theta times i, in, I infinity, theta plus i infinity, right, you have this function multiplied by this, that's an exponential function, right, exponential function. S okay, so that that's the form formula you're talking about, right? So uh, let's let's try it. So uh, in that case, so you can figure out the the poles because you need to choose a beta that to the to the right of all the poles, right? So let's just draw it here. Just draw it here. So you have the denominator is uh, separate. You can separate it in the S plus I K times S minus I K, right? So you have two of them. Uh, you have IK and then minus IK. Right. And then you have, uh, so they are all on the imagined axis. So to the right of it, so any, any beta, positive beta should be fine. So just any beta. Okay. So uh, to evaluate this integral, so you just close it at infinity because that's the um, that's the usual way for for positive t. So this is t greater than zero. T minus negative t, of course, uh, is going the other way. So that uh, when you go the other way, it's totally analytic. So the Inverse transform is zero, so that that uh, we already talked about that. So going this way, so you have uh, you enclose two poles, and there's no branch cut, so the only two simple poles. So the contribution is just add up the contribution of the two poles, and multiply by two pi as a cancel with that. So it's just sum summing over the two pole two residues, right? Two residues. So for so for this one, so this is uh, s e this is s equals to ik. So you multiply s minus ik. So what is left is you have a uh, s plus ik here because you cancel s minus ik, and then everything is s equals to ik. The ik t and the s equals to ik. Right, and then this is uh, this is I mean s equal i k so it's two i k. Okay, so that's that's the contribution from this pole, right? And then add um, 
and of, of course, uh, there's no contribution from this, this circle because of the Jordan lemma. Okay. Now the second one is uh, is pole. So it's S equals to minus I K. So you multiply by S plus I K. So what is left in the denominator is S minus I K and S equals to minus I K. So it minus two I K. Okay, and then you have E to the minus I K T. And then S is minus I K, right? Okay, so, and this two minus sign cancel. So the two, uh, the coefficient are the same. K cancel, right? I cancel, only one half, one half, e to the I K T plus e to the minus I K T. Right. You see, so along the way, which step are you seeing? Yeah. Oh, the minus sign. Yeah. Which 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 term is that? Like I, I mean, you need to throw out a singular term. Oh, which part are you seeing? Term. I thought I was actually going the other direction, just the straight Laplace trans sign. Of okay, the other direction. So you are saying that this one. So you are saying that whether this one is equals to the Laplace transform of cosine. So Laplace transform is zero to infinity e to the minus s t, and then cosine k t d t right. And going this direction is also possible. It's also possible. I mean, this is a yeah, different way to do it. Um, one way is uh, using the exponential function, right? This is this is going to like like this one, right? Okay. This is uh, one half of infinity. So you have two two terms. So you have e. This term, you have E I K minus S times T, and then plus E minus I K plus S T. Right. And now you use the usual differential. Differentiate, I mean, integral. So this is e to the i k minus s t divided by i k minus s. And then you have oh, plus or minus e to the minus i k s t divided by i k plus s. And evaluate zero and infinity. Okay. So at infinity, because of this s, uh, for positive s, of course, for positive s, this two is uh, zero. The exponential function is zero. This one? Because s is positive, right? You consider positive s. Consider positive s. And t goes to infinity, so you have the exponential minus s t factor. That one goes to goes to zero when t goes to infinity. And with k, it is i k is a uh, k is a a just a uh, parameter. So. And you, you can choose it positive or negative, doesn't matter because the cosine is sym symmetric function. So assume k is positive. Uh, so that one, for this limit, it doesn't matter if you're, you're setting t equals zero or infinity. Right? So this is just the uh, numerator. I mean, the denominator, this, this, this one doesn't affect it. 
So you just substitute a, like zero, this is one and this is one and this is one. And you combine the, the denominator. So this, this times that will get S squared plus K squared. And then you have the numerator will be S, this will be S plus IK minus uh, IK minus M bigger plus S. So it becomes two S and then cancel the two, you get S divided by S squared plus K squared. This one, yeah, that one require S. So the usually has a restriction. Well, this must be greater than zero. Okay. I mean, sometimes you push the limit to S equal to zero, but uh, that need to be a little careful about that. So if S is zero, you go to this, this integral, of course, you see that the, uh, this is one, this is cosine kg is always just oscillatory. And this integral doesn't seem to exist because it's, uh, I mean, it's going forever, right? going to dt cosine kt is not always non-zero. And, and so the, but by this result, it looks like you set s equal to zero, it will, will be equal to zero, which seems to be a contradiction but uh, you need to remember this, this, this uh, property is restricted to this limit. So if you can push as close to zero as you want, but it must be a little positive. So you cannot exactly take it as to zero. So you must exclude that, that one point, S equals zero point, right? Then, uh, then there will be no problem. You set exactly S equal to zero, then of course you get a contradiction. So usually you, you require a slight uh, positive real part in S. Okay. Uh, so that might be a, a little confusing. You just uh, push the limit too far to, to exactly zero. Okay. Yeah, okay. All right. Any any other uh, homework question? Okay, you still have uh, until Friday. You can ask me uh, on Friday. Okay. All right. Then uh, let me get this. You have any question on the integral equation? The last time is just uh, basically introducing the terminology which is sometimes important, especially when you're taking an exam. And then uh, just talking about, it, you can convert uh, an, inter sometimes you can convert the differential equation to integral equation and vice versa, but not always. So that's just a uh, illustration why you get the uh, integral equation. Now to the next section is uh, some special cases that you can, well, solve the integral equation. So the first one is too trivial to talk about. It's just an integral transform. So if the integral equation is of the form of an integral transform, of course, you know how to solve it because uh, the solution will be just the inverse formula. So that doesn't really, uh, I mean, it's, it's a little bit trivial. So there's a, a list of different integral transform, Fourier transform, Laplace transform, and so on, or even Henkel transform. But anyway, uh, those are well known. So we know, don't need to talk about that. So the ne next case is uh, slightly more general, slightly non, that non-trivial, uh, but not by a whole lot. It's still using the transform, but uh, it required that the form of the kernel is uh, of a special form. So the integral is like a convolution so that we can use the convolution theorem so that uh, well, turns out to be straightforward. So the example here is, uh, first they're using the Fourier convolution theorem. So you have a function K, this is a function, not a constant. 
um, x minus t, and then multiply the function you want to solve phi t dt. Okay, so this is uh, of the form of a, of a convolution, right? Uh, although the, the, the definition of convolution might, might have a constant, in fact, it depends on convention. So anyway, um, uh, you can use the convolution theorem and take the free transform of, of this function. The free transform of a convolution we talk about is just a product of um, free transform of the two function. Okay, we, we, we show that. So it means that this function is the inverse Fourier transform of the product of the Fourier transform of these two. So you can write uh, in equation 20 point 23 after you're taking care of all the constant, it turns out to be this one. So you can go back to the convolution section and see that this is correct. Omega. Phi omega e to the minus i omega t. So this is a inverse Fourier transform formula with the Fourier transform of this function given by this. These two are the Fourier transform of the k function and the phi function. Okay, so that kind of uh, uh, straightforward just by look using the convolution theorem. Now, assuming F is a known function, you know how to solve is Fourier transform. So, so this one is the Fourier trans, this one is the Fourier transform of F or you can just write it as F or medium. Uh, actually, uh, you need to, you need to a little bit to, this should be f omega divided by square root of two pi using the convention of the textbook. Okay, so because uh, it, the free transform in, in this textbook defined with a one over square root of two pi in both the forward and inverse transform. So it's just constant, you just need to be a bit careful. Now, because of that, you can solve what you want. This is, uh, this is for omega will be just uh, f omega divided by square root of two pi a omega, right? So that's just straightforward. And once you have that, uh, the function that you want to solve is just the uh, inverse free transform of this one. So uh, and that will involve also one over square root of two pi. So all together one over two pi and you have, uh, F omega, A omega, and e to the minus i omega t. t. Okay, so yeah, this. So given by given this, uh, you can solve the function by this way. All right. So this is slightly less less uh, obvious, but then. It's still a pretty special form because the function k required to have this functional dependent x minus t. Okay. Uh, all right. So, so it's sometimes useful if you actually have an integral equation that depends on that form. And then uh, this is for using Fourier convolution so that this, this integral equation is the flat form. When this is the flat form for the of the first kind. I mean, you can solve for the second kind also. If you have a second kind, you have a phi also outside of the integral that will just introduce another capital phi outside the integral. You can still solve it. So either first kind or second kind, you can solve it this way. Okay. And then uh, for the Volterra one, that means you have a T or you have an X in the limit. and in that case, uh, you can still use convolution, but that the convolution becomes the Laplace one. So this, that's the next example. So you get the, the Laplace convolution theorem, which we also talk about. 
And so this example is slightly longer, and but the essential part is just the same. So I will go through that because uh, so this method, although is a kind of uh, straightforward and can solve the unknown function in a straightforward manner. Um, that met, this method is still a little bit special because you require the form of a, a special form. The integral is a convolution, so it's a little bit too special. So I will talk about other thing more. The next one actually is also very special. It's required the kernel, the kernel function. Um, that is actually just a, a generating function of some kind of special function. And uh, so uh, it's pretty special. Um, so I also want to go, don't want to go through that uh, too much. It's very straightforward if you just read over. And it's, it's even more special than this case because uh, it's very unusual. You get the integral equation with the kernel just a given by a generating function or a special function that is just too special. Okay, and a less special case is, uh, that's always true that uh, a kernel can be explained uh, using basis function. So, uh, whatever basis function you can use, uh, sine, cosine, or, or the gender polynomial, or depends on the upper limit or lower limit, uh, the boundary. That can always be done because the kernel is a function of two, two variables. So that expansion will be expanded in the in basis function of two variables. You have basis. So it's a double basis. So you, have, you have a basis in function of X and the other basis in function of T. And then you need a double, in, double summation. And that can be done. It's, uh, I mean, always can be done. I mean, subject to some uh, smoothness uh, existing of the kernel, but then that can be done. But then the resulting uh, equation that you need to solve for so the unknown function will also be explained in the in the, the basic, and you have unknown coefficient. But then to solve for those those coefficient, we require the uh, solving a matrix equation, and the matrix matrix equation, the dimension will be of infinite dimension as, unless the series expansion truncate. And so, uh, so it's still quite complicated to do that, especially solving an, an, an infinite limit, an infinite dimension matrix equation is not uh, trivial. It required the, either the, the series uh, converge uh, fast enough, you can truncate that, or you have some method to solve for the large, um, the, the boundary term basically. If you can solve that and uh, solve the major equation analytically, that can be useful. Otherwise, uh, may not be uh, easy. To, uh, so, We'll uh, concentrate on for this section on the, the last method, so called separable kernel, uh, because uh, it's actually um, more common to have this kind of uh, integral equation. Another reason is that the, the past COM exam, um, all in this form, they are, they are all questions that based on. Uh, integral equation that is in the form of separable kernel. So if you remember how to do that and you, you in the column you see an integral equation with a separable kernel, you know how to solve it. Okay, so this is uh, practically um, for those of you that are taking the column. That, so when you see an integral equation, don't panic. And you see the kernel is separable, you know how to solve it, okay? And so we'll, we'll do this one. Uh, we can work out a more example for that. Okay. So, uh, we'll start with uh, now the, we can do a third home one. 
this is the third home of the second kind. I mean, you can do the first kind also, but then uh, we do the third home. So this is the equation five x plus uh, equals to f x plus lambda times uh, integration a to b a kernel x and t by t dt. So this is the third home of the second kind. And if f is non-zero, that is uh, inhomogeneous. If f is zero, that's a homogeneous. Okay, and we can solve for both. For the inhomogeneous one lambda, it doesn't matter. Lambda can be anything. Uh, but for homogeneous one lambda would be a eigenvalue uh, in order for, for, the, for the existence of solution. Okay. Now, uh, this kernel in, in this form, of course, is general, but then uh, for the separable kernel, what it means is that uh, this kernel K can be written as a sum over the textbook using J. So there is a finite number of terms that is a function of X terms, a function of Okay, if the kernel can be written as that, uh, then you can use this method, right? And of course, uh, this n has to be finite in order for this to be, uh, to be uh, I mean, more useful because uh, if you let the n goes to infinity, obviously uh, many, Functional form of, of the kernel can be written like that as infinite series of uh, separable, separable terms. So that is uh, al almost always positive or possible, but uh, because you have n, n is infinity. What is uh, for, uh, eventually you need to solve an equation of a matrix equation that becomes a, again a matrix equation of infinite dimension and now you have a problem to solve that okay so we usually just uh, restrict it to a finite n and usual n for us uh, for, at least for practical purpose n is a small number so a few just a few terms so that uh, the matrix equation is not di too difficult to solve okay so that's that's the idea now we can use this form and plug in that and get the general formula, but the, the idea is that uh, when you see a, a when an a integral equation is given to you with a separable functional form, you don't have to follow the, the general formula, even though if you don't remember the general formula, that doesn't matter. So only the process is important. When you, when you remember the process, you don't need to, to remember the general formula. It's just, go through the process and divide the matrix equation that you need to solve and solve the matrix equation, which is just a, a set of linear, linearly, I mean, a coupled uh, equation. So that usually when N is small, like N is less than less or equal to three, and that is uh, usually easy to solve. Okay. so. It, that is the, 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 the process. Don't actually need to remember the formula. We'll plug that in and, and divide it in a, uh, a formula, but that formula, if you forget about that, that doesn't matter. You just remember the process, how to do it, or the reason why you can, why this kind of equation can be solved. Just remember how, you, how that can be solved. And there's, then uh, the, the rest would be just straightforward. Okay, now, uh, now you plug that in, plug this one to here, so phi to x plus lambda sum. Okay, now the, the trick is that uh, m doesn't depend on the t, which is the integration variable, so you can take m out. 
Okay, so the rest of the integration just involve n this capital n t upon t. Okay, so um, after you writing in this form, this integration will just give you a constant out, just just a value because. Uh, there's no x in, in in here so this integration you can just call give it a name and let's see what your textbook call it uh i think it's a c c this is so if this is defined as c sub j okay so once you're written in that obviously the function functional form of your solution is given just your the inhomogeneous term f plus a sum over some constant times this m function. Okay, that would be the form of your solution. Okay, and then uh, then I think this this is the equation twenty point thirty thirty six. Okay, so now you have this this form, and once you have this form, you can plug this back to this equation. So this is an equation saying that cj c sub j equals to this integral, but then this phi can be written in this form, which is f plus lambda times sum over m sub j times c sub j. Okay, let me just write. I will explicitly c sub j equals to integrating a to b and you have n sub j t. Now this phi is using this form. So it's f times f as a function of x. Now x becomes t because phi is a function of t. So, so you change x to t. Okay. And then plus lambda sum over. Now this sum you cannot use j because you already use j here. You use another another uh, index. What is what is used in your textbook? Uh, I think it's i. It doesn't matter what you call it. So i from one to n, right? And then m sub i. Because this is in the here, so m sub i is your t times this is just a constant. This, this is c sub. That's that's why like c sub i. And then dt. This is uh, yeah. This is dt. Because this is phi. This is n. This is phi, and this dt. Okay, now this is in the form of a matrix equation because uh, this is C sub J, right? And there are two terms. One term doesn't involve C, so this is the term that is N, N sub J times F, F as a function of T, integration over T over this limit, and you can call that a, give it a name. So this, this integral, the first term is B sub J, and the second term has uh, uh, has a summation, right? Has a summation, and you can take the lambda out. And the integral is m sub i times n sub j, right? And any reason over t, c sub i is just a constant. It's just a, a, a Unknown coefficient you want to solve. The rest is uh, given by this, this times that integrating, and we call that uh, a sub i j. A sub i j, and multiply by c sub j. Okay, this, you, you get you get this process. So b sub j is this integral, n sub j times f and dt. So that's b sub j. A sub ij is 
integrating n sub j times m sub i over t. Okay, so that uh, will give you this form. And this clearly is just a matrix equation that can be solved, right? You can, if you want, you can combine this term and that term becomes a, a matrix. So just in, introduce a quantical delta here. So that becomes a, if you want, I can write out the use of, uh, if you combine the two, so you have uh, this quantical delta, ij plus uh, lambda base, yeah, ij. It's a, this is C sub i, sorry. C sub i. This is C sub j. Okay. This is i, j, and a sub. Uh, I mean, I can uh, write it this way first, and then multiply by C sub i, summing over summing over i, because it's summing over i delta i j c sub i will give you c sub j, right? I guess actually it's minus, put it to the other side. And that is equals to d sub j, right? So that is a matrix equation. So this is a, a matrix, right? You can, although this is not exactly in the form of a matrix, you can always take the transpose and call this a, a, a transpose of an, another matrix A transpose J I and then times C sub I, that becomes a matrix, right? And now C sub I will be equals to the inverse of this matrix times D sub J, right? And you have a solution. Once you have the C sub I, you have the solution because uh, this is a coefficient. If you, if you notice all this coefficient multiplied by m, multiplied by the lambda plus f, this is uh, this would be a solution. Okay, is it clear? That's, that's this pause. I again, the, the pause is more important than the formula because uh, if you remember the formula, you need to remember the formula of so b given by this and a sub so ij given by whatever this times that. I mean, that is. I mean, although you can remember that, but uh, it's subject to error, right? So you can remember something wrong and uh, make an error that way. But uh, whatever the functional form that is given to you in a, like in a question, in this form you can identify that is just separable. Usually it will be just a few terms, two terms, three terms. So that will not be very difficult. And the functional form M and N usually is uh, simple enough so that the integral can be done. So then you just plug that in and then uh, define this as your constant and you write a few equation, few linear equation that uh, couple together and form a matrix equation. Then you can either solve it by the matrix method or by other methods. So this just linear couple equation that you can solve it by many different ways, okay? And uh, that equation that the once you solve this all this the coefficient c c sub j and c sub i, then plug that back into this equation, you get your solution. Okay, so so that is uh, simple enough. Okay, and one more complication is that uh, when f is zero, when f is zero, all this b will be zero because this is zero. And B sub J would be zero. So that would be zero. In that case, F is zero, means B is zero. Then this becomes an eigenvalue equation. So that's just a matrix the equation times C sub I equals zero. So you need to solve a lambda by setting the determinant of this matrix to be zero. And to solve a lambda, so lambda usually we have a, depends on the depends on the number of n, so, so the n solution, n eigen, eigenvalue, okay? And once you get the eigenvalue, you can go back to the matrix equation and solve for the eigenvector. Eigenvector will be all these phi, phi is i, and they are 
up to a constant. So if you want, you can normalize that. Okay, and that would be the whole solution of eigenvalue problem. Okay, so that is still, so you can use this to solve a inhomogeneous equation that you, then lambda is unimportant, you can have to absorb that back to K, that doesn't matter. But if F is zero, the lambda is important, it's an eigenvalue. So not all I lambda will have a solution. So at lambda only equals to eigenvalue, you, you have solution. Okay, so, all right. So, uh, again, this is more common. So let's do a, a, a let's follow your textbook to do a, an example, which is uh, straightforward. The first example is eigenvalue problem. So, So again, uh, we'll just throw out all the formula, just, just solve it by uh, a straightforward manner and don't need to remember the, for, the form of the, all these formulas. So phi x equals to lambda times integrating minus one to one p plus x dt. Okay. okay. Okay, so this is the form that we wanted to solve. I mean, before you learn about how to solve integral equation, you might panic when you see an equation like that, you don't know how to solve. But once you, you learn that it's because it's separable, it's easy to solve actually. So the nothing first very special about it. And a form of integral equation, just, just that form doesn't, should not, uh, should not uh, make you feel it's difficult actually. Once you know that the kernel is separable, that uh, you should know that it's uh, easy to solve. Okay. So, no, we just keep doing it. So, uh, so, so the first one is, so it, there's two terms, we just write out explicitly. Lambda terms, the first term is T phi T dt, right? That's the first term. And the second term, X is uh, not involving in the integration variable. So take that out, one is going to one. And now you just find T. Okay, so that is a step forward. And now you can define your C, the coefficient, and which one is which doesn't matter which one is one, which one is, I mean, you can give, give them names. So like you call this C sub one, you call this C sub two. Okay, so it doesn't, doesn't really matter. So what it means is that, writing phi directly, writing out it out directly. So it's lambda times C sub one plus C sub two times X. Okay, so this is, this is your phi, okay. And then uh, in order to solve for phi, you use this two equation. So C sub one is equals to lambda one I mean, no, no lambda, integrating minus one to one, T times this phi. So T times uh, phi is this, you have a lambda, C sub one plus C sub two. Now X change to T, T. Okay. Just basically plug this back to here and you get this one. And this integral is trivial to integrate because uh, it's just integrating T. So let's just write out explicitly lambda. The first term is T, DT, you got T squared over two, T squared over two, uh, and then evaluate the uh, one and minus one, right? And 
obviously because t is an odd function that should be zero right because the lambda one to one right so the, the limit is symmetric the function is odd so oh, that should be zero and then uh, c sub two uh, times t square integrating out would be t q over three right t q over three and then evaluate one and minus one so you have a two of them so two two over three right that is uh, and then times c two c sub two Okay, so this is c sub one equals to two c sub two over three times one there. Okay, and you do it for this one also c sub two equals to integrating minus one to one. Phi is given by this one lambda c sub one plus c sub two t dt. Now, now you you know that the second term we see this is odd, this is even. This is even, it's just a constant, so it's just two times this one. Two lambda C sub one. Right? So, uh, so now this becomes a, I mean, this is in principle is in the form of a matrix equation, but you don't have to put it in the form of matrix equation because this, this two equation is simple enough just one proportional to, to the other. So uh, you can just substitute this in the C sub one. So this is uh, two lambda times two C sub two over C. Another lambda is lambda squared. Okay. So for C sub two non-zero, so we, you require the Lambda square equals to three over four, or lambda equals to plus or minus square of three over two. Okay, that should be the solution. <laughs> Let's see if I got it correct. So lambda is plus or minus square of three over two, right? All right. So, so now you get to two lambda. So you have two. Two, two eigenvalues, and so you have two eigen, uh, two eigen function. So for, I mean, you you know all how to do it once you have that. So just for completeness, so for lambda equals square root of three over two. So phi, so call this phi phi plus or so, so phi plus is. Uh, square three over two and no uh, no times c1 I mean there's up to a, a, a constant c1 right this is c sub one and then c sub two can be using this one so two uh, plus two lambda Lambda c sub one, that's c sub two times uh, times x, and and lambda is for this one is you can change it back to square root zero two c sub one times. I mean, it's just, the rest is a simplification. I I don't know to just put put that out and because you solve the eigenvalue for up to a constant. So that doesn't matter. So you can keep this C1 as your arbitrary constant. If you want, you can require that uh, it's normalized, meaning says sum over the square of phi over this range is equals to one. Then you can solve for the C1 as a normalization constant. Okay. And so the rest is just trivial, so I won't go through it to whether the, I mean, you, you can look, look at the question if you're asked to solve that, whether it asks you to normalize it or, or just leave it as a constant. If you leave it as a constant, then any way you, you like is fine. 
because uh, any constant is fine. Okay. And this, similarly for lambda is minus the minus value. Okay. Uh, so that is uh, this example in your textbook. And so this is a, this is a eigenvalue problem with a homogeneous one. Let, let me look up a, um, in homogeneous one. So let me just look at that, see if I have it here, this here somewhere. Because, uh, uh, With just a, a few minutes left. Just wanted to finish it. Let me look up here in my computer rather. Okay. Uh, because I want to show you the calm exam. Uh, just wait for me a little bit. <laughs> All of there is uh, almost time, so. Uh, I should have look at that first. Uh, oh. Unfortunately, just uh, wait a little bit. Yeah, fine, yeah, fine. <laughs> it's a past calm question. So I just, so in addition to that, I just want to show you the, what can we ask for you to do? And it's still in the form of separable uh, equation, separable kernels. You have X in here, and then plus uh, whatever that is, one half. And Minus one to one, and then x plus t times t square and t dt. Almost all of terms are won't exactly solve it for you, but just to so that you have seen something like that and don't get panicked because of the form. At first, it doesn't look like it's separable because your x plus t in this form, which is uh, not separable, but then uh, you have t's, but then you remember they are, uh, you can sum over different separable terms with this term. This time t square is separable because it's x and times t square. And the second term is exactly separable because it's t cubed, and then you have no x. Right, so let's just write a few terms out. So your x plus one half. Just write it out explicitly. So you have two terms. One is minus one integrating minus one to one. X is out of the integration. So your x, so you have t square phi t dt. So that's one. And then plus. Um, Integrating, or you can absorb that to here. It doesn't matter. And then T cube, T 
18. Okay. So now you, you go through the same process and call this uh, like your C sub one, that's your C sub two. Okay. And now the equation you want to solve is uh, this plug that, uh, or you write phi first, phi x is x plus one half c sub one x plus c sub two. Okay, so that's the form of your solution. Okay, and then you put it back to these two. So c sub one is equals to integral minus one to one, and then t square multiplied by x plus one half c one times t plus c two. T. Oh, this is T, sorry. Okay, the C sub two is likewise, except that is TQ because we have C and T and two. Now the idea is that the uh, these two equations are uh, two linear equations with two unknown C sub one and C sub two. After you do the integration, which is trivial, right? All this equation, all the terms in integration in T is uh, trivial. So you get this number out. So, so it becomes this linear equation. It's, it's a set of inhomogeneous equation because you have this inhomogeneous term. This doesn't involve C, this term doesn't involve C. So, this two equation will allow you to solve for exactly what the value of C sub one and C sub two. And once you get C sub one and C sub two from this two equation, you plug that back to here, you get your solution. Okay, so this is even easier than the eigenvalue problem because um, there's no eigenvalue. So you just solve for whatever these two numbers are and put it back, then you get your solution. Okay. So I won't go through it because it's very straightforward. You just do this integral, which is straightforward, and then solve the two linear equation for, for the two unknown. That is also trivial. Once you do that, then you get your solution. So although the form at first looks like horrible, you may not know how to solve, but the, knowing that is is separable, the process should be straightforward. Okay. So that's the the example for inhomogeneous Breton type uh, equation. All right, any question? All right, so uh, we'll move on to other method next time.